this morning. So um, last month, the Grace Church staff from all three campuses got together to um, just meet and greet, talk stuff over, and to start the meeting, we were broken up into teams, and we were supposed to do this team building exercise, and the assignment was to build the tallest tower. We had one marshmallow, spaghetti noodles, and one piece of duct tape. That was what they gave us to make this tower. And you know, the, the second the time began, we, it was a timed event, the strategizing and the smack talk started. That was my contribution to the, <laughs> to the event was the smack talk. But um, we had a great cross section of skills in the group and out of the box thinkers. So we talked things through, we came up with a strategy we adapted as we built. We, we allotted um, enough time to, to get everything done. And, um, and then came the judgment. The judges were walking around looking. And I bet you already know the, the outcome of the event, or I wouldn't be telling you about it. We won! Yay! <laughs> There is our team with the tallest, um, tallest tower. So <laughs> once we have the foundation of marshmallows secure, um, we built a strategy to help us win. And you know, it was critical for us to have our foundation right, but it was also the strategy of what we built on that foundation that helped us win. The foundation was absolutely critical but we could not win unless we came together on a direction and then followed those directions. And, and friends, I think the same is true for our lives. We got to have a solid foundation, but we also need a direction to go in this life. And in this regard, I think we, we cannot be haphazard. I think it's important that we determine that we want to thrive, not just survive. You know the difference, right? I was talking to somebody right before we walked in here today, and she goes, I just, I just feel so full of the Holy Spirit and so full of the joy of the Lord today. That's thriving. That is thriving. That's what we're all after. And happily for us, the God whom we love and who deeply loves us serves as our foundation for this life. And guess what? He's not only the contractor for the foundation, but also the structure that comes after that. He's our general contractor. And I want to tell you, I want him building my home, don't you? Scripture says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless we allow God, and I say allow, we have to invite him in. We have to invite him to take control of our lives. We need to invite him to be the head of our households. You can go on, Shannon. Last week, we started a series called Win at Home, and we discovered if we really want to have a strong home, one that will withstand the storms, that we have to have Christ as our foundation. There's a song, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking stand. He is our foundation. He's the one that we look to and surrender our lives and our homes to if we want to really when, if we really want to thrive. Uh, last week, um, we talked about home, and I mentioned that home is not only uh, the structure in which we live, it's also where we find our home. Um, I find myself at home when I walk into a recovery meeting because they're my people. I need them and they need me. I find myself at home when I come here. At this place, um, the people here, you, are my family. I don't have um, family here. I have you. You're my family. I feel home when I come here. So at your home, 
uh, your actual home. You may have you and a spouse. You may have you and a roommate. You may have you and a goldfish. Um, that's it. Some of you have co-workers that are like family to you that you feel at home with. This is what the home means. It's the people and the places that we feel at home. So I've gone through the process of actual home building, and I know many of you have too. Um, I remember vividly when um, I've built a couple of, well, the contractor built a couple of houses, and, and I just remember some of the stages were like, you know, dirt moving, whatever, get, get with it. You know, but when that foundation went in, now we're on to something, right? What comes after the foundation? The framework, right? It's the framework. Once that framework went in and even before the drywall went up, I could see this place coming together. I could see the flow of the home. I could see myself actually living in it. The blueprints finally made sense. It was so, so exciting. Friends, our lives need a firm foundation and they need structure. They need a framework. We need a direction that we're moving in in our households. If we want the vision that we desire for our homes, my vision for my home is that it's my sanctuary from all that out there, right? So my home, I, I desire peace in my home. Um, if we want the vision, if you want the vision that you have for your home, whatever that might be, some people, um, I talked to somebody this week, and her vision for her home is that all the neighborhood kids come to her house. That's her vision, that the kids all know they can come to her house. Um, whatever that is for you, we need God's direction and guidance. Amen? Amen? Truth is, though, that's easier said than done because some of our homes and lives are all over the map when it comes to direction. And from my own experience and observation, there's been a few ways that I want to talk about this morning where struggles arise. And the first one is that uh, some of us have homes with no direction. There's a feeling of just trying to keep our nose above water, and we don't even know which direction to go in, and, and it's just very confusing, and decisions get made impulsively, and, and then we react or we overreact to things rather than carefully, prayerfully respond to things. And can I tell you, that makes the climate in our homes unpredictable and stormy, doesn't it? Spiritual growth is difficult to manage when there's no direction in the home. It's like every day is a, a, the game of survivor. Everybody's going off, they're doing their own thing, and it's no wonder things are hard because from the minute you get up to the minute you go to bed, it's outwit, outsmart, and outlast, and that sounds like chaos to me. Everyone's going in different directions because there's no direction. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you've lived like that all your life. But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, God doesn't create chaos. He creates from chaos. This is the very nature of God, and it goes all the way back. I want to share something with you that I realized. I realized this in seminary and... Um, because we studied creation stories, bless you, we, stu we studied creation stories from all kind of different faith practices. And what I discovered in all those different faith practices that um, their creation stories had gods, you know, the Greek gods, all those. They had these gods, and these gods were set on uh, domination and control and were somewhat destructive. You know, Thor, the god of, th you know, he's going to get you. Our God 
Our God is a loving God. Our God wants a relationship with humanity, not to control humanity, not to destroy humanity, but to, to have this loving relationship with humanity. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and God was there, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. That word formless and empty translates in the original language chaos. But what is God doing? He is hovering over it, and he creates something beautiful and good out of it. And that's why you can look to God for direction in the midst of your chaos. If you feel like you have chaos in your life, I, I urge you to give it to God. Place your chaotic life in his capable hands and he'll make something beautiful and good. Maybe not an easy process, I will tell you that, but he'll make something beautiful and good and stable out of it. Now, some of you are thinking, my home is just the opposite. It's not that there's no direction. It's that there's too much direction. Instead of having no plan, you have too many plans. Your schedules are packed. Your to-do list is empty. It's go, go, go. From the second you wake up, you have little time for anything else and your goals. And getting all those boxes checked off is your number one priority. A while back, we took a survey in this room, and you indicated that the top problem you have is balancing busy schedules, and that leads to difficulties. When we find ourselves going in too many directions, you know what I'm talking about, right? We find ourselves exhausted. It always leads to burnout. We, we feel so weary mentally and physically and spiritually, and we can't Find the time to just slow down and be, just to be still and know that he is God. Just to be still and, and breathe and think about the goodness of God. We sacrifice ourselves on the altar of productivity, tight structures, and what this leads to is a need for control. Got to be in control. Got to have control. Got to control everything and everyone in the household. And everybody's got to march to this beat that you've decided. And I want to tell you, <laughs> that is a starter kit for resentment. Because if you're someone who is trying to control everything, I can guarantee you that people are not going to meet your expectations. They're not going to. And if you are the one who feels like you're under someone's thumb, it's a painful place to be because you know you're not going to meet those expectations and you live in fear. That's why we're encouraging everyone here and every member of whatever household or whatever group we're talking about to make a choice to have a home that is surrendered to God, that, to have a home where our relationships and everything about us allows God to be the head of household. God is the one in control. Our desire and attempt to control is an illusion. God is the one in charge. And I got to tell you, as painful as it might be that you don't get to control everything, it is also a fantastic relief when you finally realize you're carrying burdens that you don't have to. When you're able to live and let live, when you're able to let people learn the lessons that they need to learn, and um, oh my gosh, when we live and let live. Now I understand if you have kids in the house, there is a certain <laughs> level, or if you have employees, we uh, plan plans, but God is the one who gives the results. Amen? It's God. It's, it's God who is in control. 
Scripture says you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. How about we look to God and his plans instead? How about we relax our grip and release control and put it into his capable hands? I know how hard that is. I really do. So there's no direction, too much direction, but also bad direction. Bad, bad. If what we're doing in our homes and our lives isn't leading us to a deeper relationship with God, if it isn't leading us to uh, experiencing the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit, joy and peace and patience and love, then maybe we have some misplaced priorities. Maybe we have some unhealthy values. Now, some we know are driven by ambition and materialism and financial success and more, and ultimately those things disconnect us from God. Ultimately, those things sneak into first place in our lives. Maybe it's not money, property, or prestige for you, but an unchecked emotion that's just running rampant in your heart and in your mind. Maybe it's an unhealed hurt. Maybe it's an out-of-control habit. Maybe it's a long-held hang-up. And it just keeps you going in the wrong direction. I got to tell you, um, I, I said this to someone earlier who said to me, well, I've always been this way, but Jesus says I've come to make everything new. Release this thing. I, I pleaded with her, release this unforgiveness you have from, from a long, long time ago. It has a grip on you. He wants to make you new. He wants to transform that and make something beautiful, make a message out of that mess. Amen? We got to let him, though. We got to let him. When we are hanging on to that kind of stuff, there is nothing healthy going on, and that is when we fall apart. I have fallen apart several times. I have gotten into a place where uh, my heart has ached, and I have felt far from the peace and the presence of God. I have uh, many times in my walk in life and journey with Jesus felt crushed. You ever felt that way? Just like you're carrying the weight of the world. And if this is you in the current state of your home or relationships, I want to say that you are in the best place you could possibly be this morning the best place. And I also, if you don't hear anything else this morning, everybody, you with me? If this is you this morning, I want to encourage you to come and talk to me or someone on the staff. There is a lot of help in this church, and if it isn't in this church, we're going to find it for you. Please don't stay in that state. Allow us to come alongside you and help. Did everybody hear that? All right, good, 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 good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Beyond that, there's hope for the home that feels like it's falling apart today because God heals and redeems a broken home. That's his MO, that's his deal, that's what he loves to do. And if your home is crushed, God can restore it. If your home is broken, God can redeem it. I don't just say this. I have lived this. I have seen it in the lives of people in this church. I have seen um, people on the brink of destruction crushed by sin and pain, some of it caused by themselves, some of it caused by others. I've seen God move, and so have you. I've seen him move in those places and heal them. God can heal and God can redeem even the greatest crushing and brokenness. And the psalmist declares this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. I want to say if you feel crushed today, this gives the Lord a perfect place to start. He is close, he sees, he knows, 
He loves you. The rescue of God is here. And we try to fix it ourselves when he is the only one who can put those pieces back together. So I want to say he will rescue you if you allow him to. Whether you've got no direction, too much direction, or bad direction, the answer is always the same. It is look to God. Look to God for direction of how you need to continue moving forward. In, um, in the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus, we see a story about God's people who were enslaved. Were they enslaved because God didn't love them? No. But they were enslaved by the evil Pharaoh, and God's people were eventually set free. He had heard their cries, and he sent a prophet named Moses to lead them into the promised land. You maybe have heard this story. But where did they go from there? It wasn't like... They were just moving from one neighborhood to the next. These people for generations had been told every move to make, everything to do, and now they're free and they have to set up a whole new society. What direction do they go in? What is the structure, the framework on which they're going to create their lives? Well, it's found in the book of Deuteronomy which is where today's main scripture is coming from. And it's in the form of a prayer, and the prayer is called the Shema. Now, my pastor friend said when we preach out here, we call it the Shema, but it's the Shema. And today, many Jews every day, stop several times a day to bring their attention back to God. Don't we drift during the day? We do. And so they pray the Shema multiple times a day, and here's how it begins. Would you read it with me? Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So what's the first word up there? Say it loud. Listen. listen. Shema means listen. So, so what's happening here with this emphasis on this word is that is there is some urgency. Listen, you got to get this. If you don't hear anything else I say, you got to get this. And Moses shares the foundation of the people's relationship with God. The Lord is our God. We are his people. The Lord is our God and we are his people. This settles it. This is the foundation on which we live. This is what they stand on. And then he gives them a new direction for their life out of slavery that is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Their lives were to be centered around loving God and understanding God's love for them. And friends, that is our direction now. It hasn't changed. He is our God. We are his children. This was so foundational that even Jesus quotes this prayer in three of the four gospel accounts of his life. It wasn't for them then. It is for us now. It's a timeless truth. Here's what Jesus said to a religious leader. Guys, these are red letter words. These are the ones that we're supposed to follow, right? One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him. They were always trying to trap him with this question. Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Read it with me. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. By quoting this and calling this the greatest commandment, Jesus re-emphasizes to his followers then and now that this is the direction of our lives too. These words were not just meant for people then. They were meant for the followers of the living word, the Lord Jesus. And, and the direction of our lives, friends, is to love God. It is first and foremost to love God and then love others and love ourselves. Now, <laughs> This instruction to love is nothing like you see on the Hallmark Channel, okay? I want to make that clear. That's not the kind of love God calls his followers to, and the word for love in this scripture, in the original, is more like the word loyal. And kings would use this same word um, to describe the behavior of um, what they wanted, what the king wanted from his followers. He wanted loyalty. And it was not only passionate, but it calls for allegiance to that king. Well, now we're hearing from the king of kings and the lord of lords. And he says this devoted loyalty is the love that God is asking of all of us. It was true then and it's true now that we would be loyal to him, worship only him, and follow his word. And I want to tell you, it is only when God is my first love that I'm able to love others and love others and love myself in a healthy way. Yeah. Now, I don't need to tell you that we have some very warped ideas of love. <laughs> Somewhere along the way, we've bought into this lie that love is a feeling, and I don't feel it. <laughs> well, love is sometimes a feeling, but it is always a choice. It's always a choice. And there are days and times when I'm not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. But friends, those days, I can still love by doing the next right thing, by staying faithful, by staying the course. Sometimes that's the best I can do. And even then, I'm loving with everything I've got. Still loving with everything I've got. You can love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, even if you're not feeling super connected with him. And it could be a day or it could be a week or it could even be a season that you feel distant, but you stay faithful. You stay faithful, you continue to worship him and, and you lean in instead of turn away. I say this and I mention this all the time because, man, I have had times in my life where I've had trouble in my life and, and I've just turned away and, and I've been frustrated and then I had to go through this horrible thing by myself instead of leaning in to the one that is my only hope. The only one who can fix this mess I've made is him. So I want to encourage you to lean in to him today. So we can see from Moses and Jesus that for my home to thrive, I must follow God's loving design. Love God, love others, love yourself. If we want to truly win at home, if we really want to win in our relationships, we need to make this determination, this is what we're going to do. But I got to tell you, it doesn't happen accidentally. So what do we do? We get intentional about this. In the next part of the text, Moses moved to some specific practices. He said, commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands. Love God, love others, love yourself. 
Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home. Read that with me. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, and when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. That's going to be important in just a sec. To the listener, to the reader back then, they understood Moses to be talking about thinking about God, about normalizing, talking about God in their everyday lives, in their everyday going out, going to work, doing whatever it is that you're doing that God would be on your mind. Regardless of where they were, home or away from home, they were to be intentionally focused on God. And there was never a bad time to talk about God. The hope in all this is that people would, would develop an everyday faith, a faith where God is real and personal and it didn't have to be in the synagogue, and it doesn't have to be in church, and it doesn't have to be in the Bible study. It's just every day, all day. A faith where God is a regular part of life, a part of our decision-making and our spending and our thoughts and our conversations and our business and our recreation and all of our everyday practices. And to develop an everyday faith, as Moses is suggesting, He was talking about developing rhythms in their lives. Rhythms in their lives. It's rhythms of faith that don't happen in here. It's not what, I mean, I can behave pretty good in here. It's what I do out there. It's what I do out there in the world and in my home that really um, marks me as a follower of Jesus. So, That means embracing God's love and responding to him in love, and that sounds good, it sounds great, but it does beg the question, does my home have practices that lead me to loving God? Does my home have practices that lead me to loving God? Um... If we want to see faith come alive in our own lives and in the lives of the people around us, it means getting intentional. It means developing rhythms in our lives. All of us need rhythms. And if you need help with this, we're going to actually look at what Moses said because all of us in different ways experience this every day. Every day you wake up, Every day you eat, most days you travel, and every day you go to bed. Those are the exact things that Moses was talking about. And while these look vastly different in everyone else's lives, we all do these things. So how about we build on these things just like Moses suggested? Now, I'm going to tell him myself, the first thing I do when I wake up, well, the second thing I do when I wake up is make a pot of coffee because I can't have my Jesus time without it. But, <laughs> but I want to tell you about an adjustment I made, and I've shared it in here before, and this may hit home for you. I used to wake up, pick up my phone, start to scroll. Oh, what a way to start the day. I stopped doing that. I determined in my life that my rhythm was going to be, I'm going to wake up, do what I need to do, make some coffee, and before I do anything, before I answer any messages, look at my phone, turn on the TV, I'm going to set my heart on surrender. Set my heart on this is the day that the Lord has made. Lord, do with me what you will today. For some of us, it's steps one, two, and three, whatever it is for you to start the day. We all wake up every day. We determine how that happens. And then we all eat. And what about at breakfast or dinner, maybe every once in a while, getting some folks together And instead of everyone, I'm not picking, I love my phone. I am not picking on technology. But to just 
put them down and, and talk about stuff. Talk about wh where you're seeing God at work or something good or something that you're grateful for or something you saw that was beautiful today. Something different, intentional to put our focus back on God. During travel time, I have always said I will not put a Jesus bumper sticker on my car because I don't always act like Jesus behind the wheel, okay? But what I've decided to do, and this was a long time ago, is to just make this worship time. To, to listen to worship music or the Bible app or, or just have a conversation or prayer time. Or maybe if you're hauling uh, other people around to, to talk, to connect. And then we all go to bed. So before bedtime, read the Bible or read a story to your kids or do a daily examination uh, or a 10th step to, to reflect on your day with God. We can be intentional, leveraging the things that we already do and use them as reminders to think on God and his goodness and his grace. Moses tells the people to do that, to create rhythms, and he has another su suggestion, and here's how he concludes. Because uh, he wants everybody to know the Word of God, and he wants everybody to think about God all the time. So they had these little scrolls, and he said, time to your hands, wear them on your forehead as reminders. Is like, do whatever you need to do. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And back then and still today, many Jews take this command literally, and they wear telephen. Uh, these black leather um, containers, and they have scriptures on them, and they wear them all the time. They're reminded of the scripture every time they turn their head because it bops them. And then there's on the doorposts of Jewish houses. If you've ever been in to a Jewish house, you'll see that little thing right on the doorpost. And in that has that prayer, that Shema, and some other scriptures so that they're reminded as they walk into your house to love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. Every time they walk in the house, they, they come in being reminded to love others. These are literal examples, but there's a greater purpose and a message that Moses was emphasizing, and that is that we need constant reminders. There's that song that says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love? Are you prone to wonder in your thoughts during the day or in your actions? I know I am. So I need reminders too. I have one at my kitchen sink. That is a place that I go to regularly. And that's what I have at my kitchen sink. It just reminds me and reminds me and reminds me that I need to surrender my will and my life over to the care of God. And then I have another painted by a special needs man in my hometown. That is in my bathroom where I brush my teeth in the morning and in the evening. And um, this man is missing an eye. And he was told that he was made in the image of God. And so this is his his um, painting of Jesus. I just love that. Maybe for you, it's a verse on your phone, something hanging from your rear view mirror, whatever it is, I want to I wanna encourage you to set yourself a new reminder, something new to, um, to remind yourself to love God, to love others, to love yourself, to follow Jesus, which is why we gave you a little reminder this morning, okay? Somebody said to me um, on the way out of the 830 service, if I put this on my dashboard, he'll go like this. <laughs> and I said, if I put it on my dashboard, he'll go like this. <laughs> But this is a reminder. You put it wherever you need it. Somebody told me this morning they were going to put it in their purse because they have a little problem with spending and, and that they would, I'm sorry if I hit a, struck a nerve. 
but that's where they're going to put theirs. Wherever you need a little reminder that you belong to Jesus, there's your little reminder that you belong to Jesus. When we create these reminders, we give our hearts and minds the opportunity to come back to God if we've drifted away. Remember one of God's most repeated phrases to his followers and to Moses is remember what the Lord has done for you. He's been so good and so faithful. He is a good, good father. That's who he is. We need reminders because we're prone to wonder. I want to call the band up, and I want to tell you that we have a take-home today. Like we did last week, it is very similar to the take-home from last week, and it's called writing a covenant for your home because whenever God's people strayed, a new covenant was written. And on this covenant, we want to encourage you to ask, what are the key values that you want to shape your home? What will you, the people in your household or your friend group or your accountability group, what do you want to agree to moving forward that's going to help all of us walk closer to Jesus? We want to invite you to set, set time to talk about this. I'll tell you a covenant that Neil and I made Obviously, we made a marriage covenant, but one of the covenants that we made is that after a certain time in the evening, we're not talking about work, we're not talking about difficulties, we're not talking about conflicts, that we are going to set this time apart, we're going to put all of our electronics down, we're actually going to go outside and sit outside and we'll see what happens because we're trying to spend intentional um, time together. You know, we're busy like everyone else. We both work full time. We both do a whole lot of volunteer work and, um, and our relationship gets put on the back burner. We wanna love God and we wanna love each other. We wanna win at home. So I don't know what it is for you, what it is um, that might be the thing for y'all to do but I want to encourage you to do it. Take the time, make the promise to God and each other that moving forward, we're going to go in a new direction. Can't wait to hear about it. Let's stand. God, we are so thankful for your love and for your grace and for your patience. We are thankful for your direction. God, you give us steps to follow, and we need to walk in them, and you will make something beautiful and good out of our lives, out of our households, out of our relationships, but only as we put you first, put you in the center of it all. And so this morning, right now, God, we declare that you are our God, that we are your people, that we want you to be the head of our households, the head of our lives, the head of our relationships. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.